It's Friday, February 25th, and the time for your Bobby Destiny Morning News update. Prime Minister Mia Motley and her CARICOM counterparts are being urged to leave no stone unturned in their calls for swift de-escalation of the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. International relations specialist at the University of the West Indies, Dr. Christina Hines, warned that a war in nearly a century could be triggered if the situation is mishandled with devastating socio-economic consequences for small states. At the same time, she has cautioned original governments against taking sides. Our position, I believe, should be in support of de-escalation and a way to diplomatically resolve this conflict in the soonest possible time. So we do not have any say over what happens in this area, but I would expect a show of support from CARICOM for a diplomatic solution and de-escalation. Generally in the region, we are not supportive of these kinds of conflicts that disturb international peace and security and that end up in severe loss of life, dislocation of populations and general harm to people who are caught in in the middle of this kind of aggressive action. According to Dr. Hines, the local and regional calls should be made without pointing a finger. I think there is support for the people of Ukraine, let's put it that way, the safety and security of the people of Ukraine. But I don't know that it is especially productive in a situation like this to... Um, overtly appear to be taking one side or another when it is that you're seeking a diplomatic solution. The violation of, of sovereignty is something that is very serious in international affairs and we see this in this conflict and it is not acceptable. However, getting all parties to cool the situation down and resolve this Officials from the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Nutritional Security and law enforcement officials have been holding talks on the establishment of a predial larceny unit. Word of this from Agriculture Minister in Dawir, who also indicated that predial larceny legislation would be introduced in Parliament by the end of next month. We were speaking before the Standing Finance Committee on the Appropriations Bill 2022 in Parliament on a Thursday. I can give you the assurance that we are working on um, the legislation that is going to deal with uh, predial larceny. Um, on February the 3rd of this year, we met with the Commissioner of Police to um, look at the establishment of a predial larceny unit within the Barbados Police Service. Um, the Commissioner of Police assured us that there's already um, work going on with the Barbados Police Service and the Barbados Defense Force under um, the caption Bird's Eye. And they are working through the Barbados Police Force tactical unit. Uh, they have started work um, in January and December as well. And um, this work will be ongoing. The minister said several initiatives to help counter the theft of produce and animals were in the pipeline, including the use of high-powered drones. The larceny, uh, just like any other criminal activity, uh, we will put the legislation in place, but we are going to need a number of other things in order for us to be able to control this. Uh, the joint effort between the Barbados Police Service and the Barbados Defense Force is one. Uh, we're certainly going to have to look at geofencing because with geofencing, um, it sends off alarms so that uh, farmers would know what is taking place on the farm. Um, the issue of using drones as well. When we discussed this matter with the Commissioner of Police, um, he uh, indicated that they were going to look at a special type of drone that is going to be able to give us facial recognition and those types of things as well. And that conversation, uh, as I said, took place on February 
February the 3rd, and we are to uh, come back to look further at this. Um, it is our wish that we can have a mixed of approaches to deal with prairie larceny. Chief Agricultural Officer Kili Holder has defended government's continued subsidies for the sector, saying that such assistance is necessary given the unprecedented challenges local farmers face. She was speaking during Thursday's discussion on the Appropriation Bill 2022 in Parliament. Holder said while some questioned the amount of money being offered to farmers, which was in the last year some $1.2 million in incentives, the industry is at a stage where significant investment in research and development is required to reach a comfortable level of stability. She said subsidies should not be seen as only beneficial to farmers, but for the general public as well. There is a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of the innovation and the research and development to help our farmers to be more productive and competitive. In the meantime, while some of that work is being done, I mean, obviously, we understand that plants take time to grow, research takes time to be done, but at the same time, you have an environment that has been rapidly changing and farmers have been asked to respond to it. Of course, we all understand the impacts of COVID-19, but also we see the impacts as well from the, the changes to the climate and, and what farmers have had to endure. We had last year an ash fall event, we had a freak storm event, and we also had a, a hurricane. Okay, and the first one in, was it 60 years? And each time it means that farmers have to start sometimes from scratch with nothing. Um, these are very difficult times and the same way that we provide assistance to persons in the community who have lost their homes, we provided food. Um, up until now, the Ministry of Agriculture through the Food and General Supplies Committee is still provisioning food for persons who have lost their homes. Likewise, we also have a responsibility to provide assistance to our farming community who will be responsible for providing food for us in the, in the event of an, a, a serious event. And There's regional and international news after this short break. Hi, my name is Michelle Hines and I own a company called HM Novelties. I have three children, two of which are under the age to get the vaccine and that makes them vulnerable. And the eldest, she is vaccinated and that's a good thing because all she wants to do is hang with her friends. I take care of my 80 year old mum, and she has many comorbidities. And I love my mum. and I would not want for anything to happen to her. I am one of the ones that suffered absolutely no symptoms for either the first or the second jab. When you have the vaccine, you have a weapon to fight against this virus, to fight against this beast. 95% of my friends and family are vaccinated and that literally makes me feel secure. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. Two developments from the region now. The Antigua cabinet has given the green light for feds to resume in the country effective March 1st, following a stop due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The details of that story from ABS News. Chief of Staff in the Prime Minister's office, Ambassador Lionel Hurst, says the cabinet has officially agreed to the return of feds in Antigua and Barbuda. Come March the 1st, we'll see uh, an opportunity for the, those who are planning FETs to be able to participate, uh, or rather to have others participate in the merrymaking uh, that comes with a FET. He says Creative Industries Minister Honorable Michael Brown has collaborated with the Ministry of Health, the Royal Police Force, and the Festivals Commission to oversee the limits on FETs based on the venue. There is a working group that is uh, currently designing uh, the maximum for each venue, so that um, if the Sir Fifth Richard Stadium that can hold 15,000 people uh, um, were a part of the FET um, venue, uh, we wouldn't allow 15,000, but maybe a smaller number. He says, however, we are still in a pandemic, so certain conditions will apply. Those who are eligible to attend will have to be vaccinated. But we're making an exception 
those who may not uh, otherwise be eligible uh, to participate will have to have um, a rapid uh, antigen test or a PCR test uh, in order for them to enter. Ambassador Hurst says these conditions are in place to keep us safe. The whole idea is to enable large gatherings uh, but with uh, conditionalities and those conditionalities are very much dependent upon keeping us away from the hospital and also uh, keeping us uh, healthy. On the international front, unacceptable but not irreversible. That's how United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres described what he called the military offensive by Russia on Ukraine. He said that the Russian military operations inside Ukraine's sovereign territory is on a scale that Europe has not seen in decades and is in direct conflict with the United Nations Charter. Day after day, I've been clear that such unilateral measures conflict directly with the United Nations Charter. The Charter is clear, and I quote, All members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations. The use of force by one country against another is the repudiation of the principles that every country has committed to uphold. And this applies to the present military offensives. It is wrong, it is against the Charter, it is unacceptable, but it is not irreversible. I repeat my appeal from last night to President Putin. Stop the military operation. Bring the troops back to Russia. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbadistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.